If you're a beginner drummer who's feeling a little lost as to how to optimize your pedal and find your ideal foot technique, whether heel up or heel down, I want to save you months and even years of potential frustration. Today I'm giving you five must-know tips that will get your pedal feeling better and help you get more speed, volume, strength, and coordination so that you can much more easily nail the kick patterns from your favorite songs with ease and play as fast as you need to on the bass drum. You can do this. Hey, welcome to The Non-Glamorous Drummer. I help beginner and intermediate drummers become the musicians others want to play with and listen to by teaching you the core skills that make the biggest, fastest difference in your playing. Today's gonna be a lot of fun because by the end of today's lesson, you'll optimize your pedal so it is ready to play as fast as you want it to. You'll know exactly where to place your foot whether you wanna play heel up or heel down. You'll understand the big difference between bouncing versus burying the beater and which is better. You'll get your foot so much more relaxed and precise by doing the beater bobbing test. This is pretty interesting. And lastly, you'll solidify your strength building and coordination with three helpful independence exercises you can take to the practice room now. But first, hey, if you're a beginner drummer, I have a special gift for you today. I want to help you quickly get going playing grooves and fills that you'll actually use in your favorite songs. So I want you to download my totally free PDF e-guide called 25 Practical Grooves and Fills for the Beginner Drummer. Now, these aren't just random grooves and fills. These 25 grooves and 25 fills are all real world tested because I've used every one of them in hundreds of songs in my 13 plus years of gigging experience. I think you're gonna have a lot of fun with this. It's gonna get you up and running quickly so you can just get going playing songs, doing what you wanna do on the drums. So grab this free e-guide, it's totally free. It is a total no brainer. Go grab that. All right, on with today's lesson. Tip number one, optimize your pedal so that it is able to play as loudly and quickly as you want to play. Because it's very possible that your pedal is not working for you and it's working against you, and that's not good. We wanna make sure that our practicing is paying off and that we're sounding great down here and we're not being held back by our pedal. So three quick things that you can do to immediately get your pedal feeling better. Now we could go super in depth with this, which we've done in other lessons on the channel that I'll link below. We're not going crazy in depth today, but we're just gonna talk about the three most important things. Beater length. So Beater length is mostly determined by the size kick drum you're playing. This is a 20 inch kick drum here on my kit, which is a little bit smaller than standard. Standard is 22. Um, 24 would be like a big rock size. So if you've got a big kick drum, you can definitely go longer on your bass drum beater. If you've got a smaller kick drum, you do have to go a little bit shorter. But pretty much you're adjusting your beater length according to kick drum size and where you want it landing on the kick drum so it's not too close to the edge. So it's relatively close to the middle. And you can also adjust your length based on what feel you want, because if the beater is longer, the pedal's gonna feel heavier, versus if the beater is shorter, it's gonna feel a little bit quicker and lighter, which is good for quicker playing, but if you're playing very loudly, you wanna have some beater length, that way you've got some throw. Think of this as, you know, when you're playing with your sticks, you can grip further up the stick like this for lighter playing, but if you wanna play really hard, really you need to grip down here so you've got the full throw of the stick. Kind of the same with a, with a kick drum pedal, where if you're playing loudly, you wanna have that beater length to really help you out there. Otherwise, if you're playing really softly, you can get by with a, a shorter length, and that might give you a little bit more control. But for the most part, you're adjusting your length based on the size of your kick drum. Second thing, beater angle. This is really important. This is more important than length. Make sure that you have a 45 degree angle, which is pretty much where I've got mine adjusted. Is just eyeballing it, it looks like it's 45 degree angle. Uh, a 90 degree would be like right here, zero degree would be way back here. We'll call this 45, halfway in between. So diagonal, that's where you want your beater. You can play around with going a little bit further than that, and that's gonna give you the potential for more power because there's more distance it can travel, right? Uh, it's just like starting with your stick way up here versus down here. If you're playing loudly most of the time, you might want to actually have your beater angle adjusted a little bit further back, like right here. We're talking subtle adjustments here, small differences. You can have it right here. Now, if you're playing quietly a lot of the time, I think 45 degrees is a sweet spot. You don't wanna go any less than 45. But what I've noticed is that if I'm at a 45 degree, I can play very lightly. But if I'm past 45, I can play loudly really well and it feels great. But when I'm trying to play softly, the beater's like slowing down before it hits the head. You don't want, you don't want it to feel like that, where it's like by the time the beater is getting close to the head, you're having to put too much pressure on it because that's gonna make it difficult to play 
quietly and cleanly. Otherwise it gets kind of sloppy because the pedal starts feeling too heavy or too stiff, like there's too much tension. And of course that's also where spring tension comes in. So that's really the third thing here, third optimization point. Adjust your spring tension so the pedal feels good playing both loudly and softly. If you're playing loud most of the time, you can get by with that tighter spring tension. You can have more resistance. It's just like with sticks where if you're playing loudly, you can have big heavy sticks and it's great. But if you're playing really lightly, you might want to have smaller sticks, you might want to have lighter sticks. So adjust your pedal accordingly. If you're playing softly a bunch, you might want less spring tension, again, so that the beater doesn't feel like it's slowing down and getting harder to press when you get close to the head. It's going to be easier to play quietly and relaxed with a little bit less spring tension, just like how you don't want a ton of angle if you're playing softly. But if you're playing a lot of heavy rock, and you're playing loudly most of the time, then that's where it's great to have a little bit of the extra angle, maybe a little bit of extra beater length and more spring tension. That's gonna help you achieve the speed while achieving the volume. Because the spring tension is like your rebound. It's like as you tighten the spring tension, it's like tuning a drum up where you can still hit hard and still get that rebound and it's gonna make it easier to play loud and fast if you also have the spring tension going along with that. So. Hopefully that all makes sense. Those are little things that you can adjust, very subtle things that are gonna help optimize your pedal for whatever style you're playing. So I recommend find the best of both worlds. You know, if you're playing softly and quickly, go for the 45 degree angle. Adjust the spring tension so that you can play quietly well and feel good about it, even though you're gonna feel some of that tension, but also be able to play loudly and quickly without feeling like the pedal's too loose or floppy. So you just have to play around with that. Definitely test this out, play around with your pedal. Don't be afraid to make adjustments to it. Tip number two, know exactly where to place your foot, whether you wanna play heel up or heel down. Now, this is interesting because whether or not you're playing heel up or heel down, it literally doesn't matter. We'll talk about pros and cons of each here in a minute. But what you don't want to do is have your foot choked all the way up the foot plate, regardless of which technique you're doing. If you're playing heel down or heel up, you never wanna be all the way up the foot plate. I've noticed that beginner drummers tend to want to do that because it's easier to press the pedal down, right? you kind of figure that it's gonna be easier to play faster or louder when it's easier to press because you get, technically, I think mechanically speaking, that would be more torque. You're able to achieve the beater motion with less effort when your foot's further up the, the foot plate. Mechanical advantage versus if you're down here, well, down here, you're actually having to press harder. It's a little bit more difficult. But here's what I want you to do. Allow two to three inches between your toes or the end of your shoe and the chain at the end of the foot plate. So be about right here. By the way, if you're a size 11, I'm going to shoe size 11, a US size 11. I know the sizes are slightly different in the UK. Uh, that means that probably if you're about my size, that means your heel is going to be on the heel plate. So if I take my shoe off, basically my heel is right here on the heel plate grip, which puts my toes about right here, where I can barely see the top of the D and the DW on my foot plate. This is about where your toes need to be. If your feet are smaller, then that just means, okay, your heel might be a little bit further up in that case. But make sure you've got two to three inches, maybe even four inches, maybe even more than that. When, I'm, when I take my shoe off, I see there's actually more space there. When you've got a shoe on, you know, the shoe's coming up a little bit further. But have your foot placed about like that, whether you're doing heel up or heel down. Let me explain a little, because I know you might be like, Stephen, why, why are we doing this? Isn't it easier to be further up? And I totally, I totally understand that question because when I started playing I was way up here and for years I played way too far up and it actually ended up I ended up tearing up shoes it ended up hurting my knee more putting more pressure on my leg a lot of reasons to not do that but here are the big ones yes there is less torque less mechanical advantage when you're further down but this actually gives you the potential for more speed and volume because you don't have to move your foot as much in other words you don't have to press down as far in order to get the beater motion in place. Does that make sense? So if you're up here, yes, it's easier, but your foot's having to move more. If you're way back here, for instance, so this would be pretty extreme, but I've seen drummers do this. If you're way back here, that means your foot doesn't actually have to move as much to get the same beater motion. So as you get stronger, you'll be able to build more speed and volume by having your foot positioned this way. Now, I, I understand this is frustrating when you're starting out because Starting out, maybe you don't have that strength there. Maybe the strength is there. Like maybe, maybe you work out and you're in good shape. You're having to train these muscles to work and maybe they, they're just not really doing it yet and you feel like this doesn't make sense, it's too difficult, I wanna be further up. You've gotta train yourself, make yourself get into the habit of being further back because you will thank yourself later and as you build up that strength, you'll find that long-term, 
this is the way to go. So that might mean sitting a little bit further back than you normally would or sliding your kick drum a little bit further away. That way you've got extra space because you wanna make sure your leg angle is not less than 90 degrees. So thigh, calf, you don't wanna be you know, like this. You wanna make sure you've got some space. So if you're sliding your foot further back like this, that does mean you need, your, you need to have your kick drum further away or slide your stool back, whatever you've gotta do. But that is gonna give you the ability to play much more loudly and smoothly, fluidly, quickly, all, all of those good things more easily as you build the strength. Yes, short term, this might feel better, but long term, this will serve you well. Take my word for it and get used to having your foot position a little bit further back on the foot plate. Now, speaking of short term versus long term, we gotta talk about heel up versus heel down. This is ultimately your choice, whatever you wanna do, no judgment. I like playing heel down and I'll tell you why, but I know a lot of drummers like playing heel up. Uh, generally, the drummers that play heel up, I've noticed are shorter people because, hear me out on this, I think that when you're really tall, when you sit down on a drum set the first time, if you're really tall, like I am, I'm 6'4", most likely that, that drum stool is not adjusted as high as it actually needs to be, and so it feels very unnatural to you know, lift your knees up uh, to play heel up when you're sitting low. It kind of feels like you're, you know, you're on a, riding a little kid's bike or something. If you're gonna play heel up, you've gotta sit higher. Now, shorter, individuals or students who start out on the drums when they're six, seven, eight years old, end up sitting at a kit that's too big for them and a stool that's too high. And so they're sitting awkwardly high, kind of like if I were to sit on a bar stool. And if I'm sitting on a bar stool, it feels more natural to play heel up. I'm not gonna try to play heel down if I'm sitting that high. So ultimately the height you have your thrown at is gonna determine whether heel up or heel down feels better to you. So I want you to keep that in the back of your head. And that's, that's my theory as to why we all end up with our natural tendencies there, like some of us like heel down more, heel up more. I think it has to do with just the way the kit was, how tall we were when we first started. Whether or not that's entirely true, playing heel up does provide you with more instant gratification regarding speed and volume, but not as much control to begin with. And so a lot of times when I've, I've taught beginner kid students in the past, they would rather do heel up because it allows them to immediately get the volume that they need. When I'm saying, hey, with these rock grooves, we need a little bit more kick drum because the kick needs to be strong and loud with rock. That helps them get there, and they find that they can actually get some speed pretty quickly too. But the problem is there's not a lot of control to begin with. It takes a long time to develop the core muscles, develop your balance so that you can actually play heel up well and play quietly heel up because qu playing quietly can be difficult heel up because of that lack of control, and it takes a lot of time to develop that. So on the flip side, heel down immediately gives you more control and stability where you're not having, your core's not having to work as hard. You can kind of just sit and relax. You've got your heel down, that's your anchor point. You're not having to feel like you're teetering. You're not having to sit higher. Um, for, uh, I think for a lot of us taller drummers, heel down feels better and that's what I've always thought. But, but there's always a catch, pros and cons here. But you'll have to work harder in the beginning to gain speed and volume. So starting out heel down, you're gonna have the control and it's gonna be great. You'll be able to play lightly pretty well, but the volume and the speed are gonna take a little bit longer just because it takes a while for that strength to develop. And so you'll have to be patient in that way. So to review, heel up, and again, I'm speaking to beginners. Let's say you're starting this out for the first time. That means that if you do heel up, you'll be able to get volume and maybe speed pretty quickly, but the control is gonna take longer. If you do heel down, you'll have the control and the stability pretty much immediately, but the speed and the volume will take longer. So choose your path. Remember that we want to think long-term and choose what feels natural to you. If you like sitting higher or maybe you're shorter and so it just, it just feels better that way, go heel up, totally fine. If you're taller and so you would have to sit crazy high to pull off heel up, like with me, I have to sit on a bar stool pretty much, then it's totally fine to go heel down, whatever you want to do. I will tell you this, that you can get whatever speed and volume you need from either technique. So whatever, whatever feels best to you. All right, beginner kick drum tip number three. And this is a really important one. Understand the big difference between bouncing versus burying your beater and know which one is better. And uh, actually, as we get into point number four, that's gonna give you a lot of the why behind my opinion on this. But Burying is generally easier. So again, talking about the instant gratification versus thinking long-term, you know, heel up and heel down, there's the pros and cons. So burying the beater is generally easier for a beginner because all you gotta think about is hitting the head. 
bam, we're done. You can easily do that heel up or heel down. And heel up, I think it especially feels natural to just stomp it down, leg drop. Playing loudly, you'll naturally just end up with that. And I started out playing a cheap electric kit back when I was in middle school, getting into high school. Cheap electric kit, and it never crossed my mind to ever bounce the beater to go like this. Because the way that pad was, there just wasn't any rebound. I probably didn't have enough spring tension on my pedal. Super cheap pedal. And so I was always playing like this. And it wasn't until later I started playing around with bouncing the beater. The thing about burying, yes, it's easier in the short term, but in the long term, it's also harder on your knee and on your leg because you're putting all this pressure down there and you're hitting a wall. Because literally the beater's slamming into the head and you feel that shock in your toes, in your foot, ankle, calf, knee. Depending on how hard you're playing, you might feel that shock all the way up your leg. And long term, I don't think that's very good physically for your leg. I used to bury the beater exclusively and by the end of a three, four hour cover gig late at night, my knee was hurting where I'd get done playing and it was like, like hobbling off the stage. And that's when I was, you know, 22, 23, 24. Not good to have knee pain on the drums, especially when you're that young. So I knew I had to change things. And so what I did, I started sitting further back from the kick or basically moving the kick drum further away. I had to mount my rack thumb on a basket stand so I could do that because if my rack thumb were mounted on my kick, it'd be way back here. So I've got all this space here so I can relax, slide my foot back a little bit, bounce the beater. So big pro of bouncing is that it's easier on your leg and I think you get a better sound. Now, the thing is, I know it's tricky when you're starting out, when you're a beginner, because I remember this, and even years into playing, it was difficult transitioning to bouncing because bouncing requires more precision and control. You have to think a little bit more. It's just like playing around the kit using rebound, like utilizing rebound and playing in a relaxed way. That means actually thinking about the motion. You're not just smacking things. You're actually thinking about what you're doing and you're being intentional so that you can be fluid. So apply that concept of rebound and being fluid around the kit to the kick drum. We wanna have rebound down here. We wanna be fluid. We wanna be able to play in a relaxed manner, which means we really need to be bouncing the beater. But that does require some intentional effort up front. But I'm going to show you exactly how to do it getting into uh, tip number four here in a minute. By the way, if you have a kick drum with no muffling in it, and especially if your front head has no hole in it, I have one of those fiber skin vintage kind of heads on the front, your kick drum is probably going to sound better bouncing versus burying. Because if you bury, you're choking it out. It's like just, you know, smacking a floor tom like this. And I know this especially doesn't work with a floor tom. You can get by doing this on a kick drum. It doesn't sound awful, but wouldn't you want to let it just ring out? You can tell me if you hear a difference. Here's burying. By the way, you heard that flutter right there. I tried to bury and it went, it was like two little quick notes. That's the thing about burying. You have to really commit to it because it's easy to end up with a slight flutter. You have to really go, really hammer it in there which is hard on your leg. Okay, here's bouncing. And by the way, I'm gonna keep my hands on my tom so there's no sympathetic resonance. We are only hearing the kick. Here's burying again. And bouncing. I know here in the room, there's so much more boom, like low end, nice musical boominess, some tone when I'm bouncing. It just sounds better and it's so much easier on my leg. So if you're not sold on that just yet, let me help you get there because I'm going to give you some specific steps for getting really comfortable bouncing and give you some even more benefits, give you some even more. I don't know if that's a good sentence. I'm going to give you more benefits of bouncing the beater so you'll be even more sold on this. So let's get into tip number four. Get your foot so much more relaxed and precise by doing the beater bobbing test. This is really interesting. If you've never uh, seen this in any of my lessons, I think you'll find this pretty interesting. This is really simple and really fun. All I want you to do is grab, reach down, grab your beater, just push it back like this until it hits the foot plate, and then just let it go. So if you have a, if you have a really nice pedal, it's going to bob for a while. Like it's going to keep going. That means that the pedal is well oiled and nice and smooth, and so the mechanics are all great. If you have a cheaper pedal, it might not want to bob for as long. But a lot of times with cheaper pedals, it's not because the pedal's stiff. It's because the pedal isn't as heavy. Because if you think about this, it's because this pedal is so heavy um, and, and because it's like anchored right, right now to the kick drum that that allows this to keep going. But if the whole, sometimes that'll happen where the foot plate hops up there. Uh, but if the whole pedal, like if this whole thing is moving along with the beater, that's going to cause it to stop bobbing 
more quickly. So just know that if you're working with a cheap pedal, sometimes this won't work as well, but you can still do this. So we're pulling the beater back. So basically till something hits the foot plate. So we can't pull it back anymore Then let it go. And what I want you to do is pay attention to the rate at which the beater is just bobbing on its own. Mine's going about that tempo. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. How fast does it bob? Think of those as eighth notes. One and two and three. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. And it might slow down. It slows down a little bit as it goes. Pay more attention to the tempo it starts at. Gun, gun, which will be a little bit quicker. Gun, 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 gun. Pulling out my metronome app. My favorite go to metronome app, Tempo Advance. This is not an official endorsement, it's just a great app that I really like. I've used it for 12 years now. Let's see what tempo this is. Maybe about 103. Let's try again. Yeah, it's about 103. So quarter note at 103, the beater is bobbing the eighth note pace. So figure out what your pedal's natural tempo is. That's what we could call this, your pedal's natural tempo. We're counting it as eighth notes. If we counted it as quarter notes, this would be 206. Uh, but if we're counting as eighth notes, that kind of puts us in more of a reasonable tempo here. So 103 is what mine is. Yours might be 110, might be 95. If you have a, remember if your beater is longer, you've got a bigger bass drum, if your beater is longer, it's probably gonna be slower. If you have a shorter beater, smaller bass drum, it's probably gonna be faster. Those are the biggest variables that'll play into this. Now what I want you to do, set your metronome to that tempo and try ghost playing, but literally going like this. It's like we're playing without letting the beater hit the head. Try ghost playing at that tempo. Now what you'll probably find is that it's kind of hard to stay as slow as what this tempo is. So I found the magic formula a lot of times is add in five beats a minute. So take that beater, natural beater bobbing tempo, plus five. For me, that was 103 plus five, 108. Goes to that tempo. Now, I know it's kind of weird when you don't hear anything, it's hard to stay in time. You kind of have to look at it. Just do the best you can. Practice ghost playing. And if you're not exactly locked in with a metronome, it's not the end of the world. The point is, be in the general vicinity of it. Just get this motion happening. And as best you can, try to not let the beater hit the head. I know mine was tapping the head. It'll tap it every once in a while. But get this motion comfortable. Notice how you can't do this if your foot is way up here, at least not well. But if you're down here, whether you're heel up, it doesn't matter, heel up or heel down, if, you're, if your foot is positioned where it needs to be, this is no problem. That's why this is really a test. This is a test of the pedal adjustment we did back in tip one. It's a test of foot placement that we did in tip two. And... This is gonna solidify why you need to bounce your beater that we covered there in tip three. So get this going. Then gradually let the beater start hitting the head so that you're playing really softly, gradually getting louder. This is kind of hard to do. It takes some control for sure. It takes some patience. And if it's really testing your patience, it's okay to add a little bit to the tempo. Add another five beats a minute, so that puts me at 113, which is about where I was just now anyways. This is easier the faster you go. When you're trying to go slow, it requires a lot of control and precision, so you can cheat, bump the tempo up a little bit. So at this point, we're at the pedal's natural tempo plus 10 BPM, which for me puts us at 113. Practice just playing as light as you can, having that beater motion going on, gradually getting louder, What's so cool about this is this means that you are using the same beater motion, the same beater distance, kind of like with stick height, to play both softly and loudly. This is very powerful because this helps you so much with building precision and fluidity and the ability to play softly and dead on in time. I've demonstrated this before in videos where we've talked a little bit about this. We've covered this in some lessons before where if I'm trying to play something really soft, I'm trying to play pretty lightly down here. If I try to you know, choke up and not allow that natural beater motion. Sounds awful. But if I allow the beater to bounce nicely. I'm 
I'm allowing basically a full beater motion, but I'm just allowing it to gently hit the head and not play hard. You don't have to play hard when you've got big beater motion. By the way, talking about angle adjustment. So as you're doing the beater bobbing test and you're having a hard time like air playing or playing really softly, that's where if you have the angle adjusted a little bit more, that's gonna, that means that you're gonna get more of that throw, more of that beater motion without hitting the head versus the further up this way you've got your pedal, the less you can really do this. So if you've got your pedal adjusted, say 45 degrees, probably going a tiny bit further back and that might actually make this easier. It might feel good. Play around with it. This is all about experimenting. Find what the best adjustment is for your pedal based on what you're playing and how it all feels to you. Now, getting into tip five, our last one. All of this is only so good if we can coordinate our right foot with what our hands are doing. So solidify your strength building and coordination with three helpful independence exercises you can take to the practice room now. These are super simple. They're gonna make sense. You'll be able to start practicing these right away. And the cool thing is that when you've got your pedal working for you, it's been optimized and you've got your foot placement squared away, you know whether you're doing heel up or heel down, you practice beater bobbing, you've done all this stuff, you are in such great shape down here, give yourself a pat on the back because you're so far ahead of so many beginner drummers if you've been tracking with me so far. So now, this last point is kind of just, let's get to where we can use all of this. Let's get to where we can play whatever grooves we wanna play, whatever kick patterns we wanna play. We now know how, we have the ability, the foundation in place to be able to play very quickly and very loudly as we practice this a bunch, as we build up our strength. So now let's just get it coordinated. So three exercises. This first one is very simple, but challenging to play quickly. So go really slow. We're just gonna play basic right hand timekeeping with the right hand, back beats on the snare, two and four. And we're gonna start off, this is just gonna be a four on the floor groove. Very simple, just like this. We want to make sure our, our, you know we're placing our foot where it needs to. We're paying attention to sound quality, beater bouncing, all that good stuff down here, making sure that it's locking in. So spend as much time doing just this four on the floor groove as you need to while paying attention to your right foot. Then once that's feeling good, and again, this is the important prerequisite, once this is feeling good, once you're feeling comfortable doing this and you know that your right foot's doing what it's supposed to, playing something very simple like this, then you're ready to go into kind of how the rest of this exercise goes. So what we wanna do is start shifting the kick so that it lands on weird off beats. That's gonna help us a lot with coordinating our right foot to play on whichever part of the beat we need it to so that we can basically play any kick drum pattern we want to. So first, we're gonna shift it over a little bit later to the E of the beat which sounds like this. It just means instead of playing on the beat, instead of going one, two, three, we're just going one E, two E, three E, four E. I know it's weird at first, but go really slow. Then after that, we wanna put it on the ands like this. which is a lot more straightforward because then it locks in with the right hand there. And that's a very common groove pattern to show up, especially in faster songs like. That's all it is. We're just playing the kick on the ands, keeping our backbeat, keeping our eighth note timekeeping. So practice that slow, but that's probably not gonna be as weird and difficult as the ease. But then after that, move on to the uhs, which would be this right here. That last 16th subdivision, one, E, and, uh, two, E, uh, three, E, and, uh, four. But I'll, I'll tell you this, that's probably the most common syncopated part of the beat to place a kick note because there's so many grooves that are kind of like this. So that pattern I just settled into there. Uh, the kick was landing on an uh three times. One, e, and uh, two, e, and uh, three, e, and uh, four. But you don't really notice how syncopated and weird the kick part is because of how it leads into something else. Uh, an uh of two kick is very natural because a very common groove is this. One, e, and a uh, two, e, and uh, three, e, and a uh, four. One, two, uh, and four. So there we just got that one note that's on an uh. 
But if we had it, if we had the kick play right before back beats, like that, then it's happening all over the place. But we almost don't notice it because the back beat keeps our ear grounded on the beat. So the kick can be crazy, but it still sounds good and it still makes sense. And there's a lot of songs that utilize kick drum patterns like that. So it's very worth practicing to do that. Make sure that you can play the kick on those weird parts of the beat, even the ease, practice it really slow, work on locking that in. And at a super fundamental level, just practice this. Right foot, right foot, back and forth. Because if you can do that, Isn't that cool how if you get that going, you can just throw in a backbeat and suddenly you've got this weird syncopated kind of kick drum pattern. It's pretty neat. So you can do a lot and it all just starts with. So if that's where you feel you need to start, go for it. Just right hand and right foot filling in the spaces. One E and a, uh, two E and a. Uh. Now, exercise number two, and this is a little bit more challenging because it involves locking in the left hand with the kick also. We're gonna basically do that same thing where we're shifting where the kick drum plays, but we're doing that underneath alternating 16ths. So if we include accents for our, like our back beats, it might look like this. like that, and it, it really is challenging getting that kick drum to lock with the left hand, and so that's the thing you wanna focus on. So at its most core level, practice that really slowly, just playing the kick on every E and every uh. You can literally just do that. Making sure those are together. And of course, then you can take this and put it on the hi-hats. Just like that. So you can build alternating 16th grooves, snare cadence kind of grooves, all while making sure your kick drum is able to play wherever you needed to play. This is the simple, most fundamental building block of freeing your right foot to play any 16th based kick drum pattern you wanna play, which covers 99% of rock songs, pop songs, country songs, if we're honest. Now, I'm gonna throw in this third one, just in case this is where you're at. Maybe you're more intermediate, maybe you're not brand new to this, maybe you've got some good coordination and you wanna work on more linear stuff. Practice rudiments between hands and foot. So it might be as simple as singles between either hand and foot, which we kind of already did, that whole thing, that's just singles between right hand and right foot. You could also do singles between left hand and right foot. Just to build that smoothness and make sure we don't have any, you know, like that. Make sure you're going slow enough, you're getting it all fluid. And you can also do doubles, you could do. Or you could do right, left, kick, kick. So it's not true, true doubles back and forth, but note wise, drum to drum wise. And then you wanna get a little bit crazier, do paradiddles, which you could start with the kick and it makes it feel more like a groove. And I kind of throw this in as a bonus in a way because there's so many different ways you can practice this. You can add in timekeeping. So we could do singles starting on the kick or the snare. We could go. And so on, or doubles. Paradiddles.
And so really we can start to use those kinds of patterns to create very linear style grooves or even fills. You can create a lot of cool linear fills just doing singles and doubles like this. So we're not gonna go into all of the limitless things you can come up with from there, but I kind of throw that at you depending on where you're at. If you're a little bit beyond beginner, you're getting into intermediate, you can start testing out some of those more linear patterns to really push your right foot coordination. But definitely start, if you're a total beginner, start by going through each of these five steps, getting this really comfortable, spend time on the four on the floor groove, making sure you're maintaining good technique and everything is good down there, then start shifting the kick over and then switch to the 16th and then you can start doing the linear patterns. But uh, wherever you're at, I hope I gave you something here to definitely challenge you. So let me know how this goes. In the comments, I got a question for you. The question that uh, we all always wanna know, are you heel up or heel down? Just tell me in the comments, do you like to play heel up? or heel down, or do you do a little bit of both? Maybe depending on what volume you're playing, what style you're playing, maybe you like to do both. Also, do you like to bury or bounce? Do you exclusively bury? Do you exclusively bounce? Do you do a little bit of both? Let me know if you agree with my methods. <laughs> Let's get some debate going on here. Let's get some discussion going, because I think it's really interesting to share different opinions and viewpoints on this. So are you heel up or heel down? Do you like to bury or bounce? Do you agree with me or disagree? Let's talk about it. And before we go, be sure to grab that 25 Practical Grooves and Fills for Beginner Drummers e-guide. If you're a beginner, this really is going to help you out a lot because it's going to give you a springboard from which you can just go and know some core building blocks, some core grooves and fills, and be able to play whatever songs you want to play. It's great to be able to get up and running quickly on the drums, and this is going to help you do that because then you can start experimenting and start improvising and start creating based off of these. So I intend for these to be your starting point. That way you can you know you can feel like hey i can do this i can get this going i can play some grooves i can play some fills and then from there get creative and, and have fun have fun playing songs that's what this is all about so be sure to go grab that in the description totally free download it take it to your practice room print it out whatever you like to do as always thanks so much for watching today thanks for hanging out this has been a lot of fun i know this has been a deep video lots of stuff lots packed into here uh, but it's been a lot of fun. I hope this has been really helpful to you and provided you with a lot of value and helps you master the drums and sound great. That's what we want to do. So I hope you have a great week. I'll see you on the next lesson. Know that you can do this. Stay non-glamorous.